It's my honor to yield the gavel to Lieutenant Governor Crouch, who will call the joint convention of the two houses to order and present Governor Holcomb. Thank you. Pursuant to Section 13 of Article 5 of the Indiana Constitution, the Indiana General Assembly is convened for the purpose of hearing a message from the governor. Ladies and gentlemen of the House and Senate, distinguished guests, I have the high honor of introducing our governor, Eric Holcomb. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, Madam Chief Justice, Lieutenant Governor, my partner, uh, members of the General Assembly, and my fellow Hoosiers, it's a real honor and privilege to report to you once again on the state of our state, that a state that is so beloved that we share so much in common as Hoosiers about how we can make it just even a better place to live and work and build a future. Please understand one thing up front. I intend to work even harder over the next two years than I have at any other time to continue to improve our prospects for every single person who calls Indiana home. After all, and I suspect for many of you, believing in this state and our people is why I wanted this job in the first place. And a ticking clock only increases my sense of urgency. And as we all know, there is much more work wanting to be done. So to that end, just last week, I laid out the specifics of my 2023 legislative agenda keeping with the very same pillars I've used over the last six years. So I'll spare you a repeat of every single detail. <laughs> However, tonight, I do wanna lay out three sets of goals and how we achieve them. Worthy of a state that is doing well, <clears throat> turning heads, and always seeking to improve. One, let's secure Indiana's place in the economy of the future. Two, let's transform the delivery of public health access across the state from how it was structurally designed over a century ago. And three, let's continue to make unprecedented investments in the classrooms of Indiana schools from pre-K through K through 12, through college and all the various adult learning pathways we offer. 
And here's why we can do all of these three things at the levels I proposed in my budget last week. Recall when I stood right here in 2017, our revenues were roughly $15.5 billion. By the end of fiscal year 2022, revenues had grown to over $21 billion. That's almost $6 billion, and we've controlled the size of government along the way. Looking forward, our revenues are estimated to exceed what we spend by $2.3 billion and expected to grow by another 3% in each year of the next biennium. Ladies and gentlemen, because of our strategic collaboration, Indiana has become known for our responsible budgets, and this one is no different. We have again proposed to make an additional $1 billion contribution to the pre-1996 Teachers Pension Fund. Since 2011, 30 years have been cut from the time to fully fund this pension, which will free up dollars for other uses beginning in 2029, not 2059. And just since 2017, we've paid down our state debt by 31%. And because our revenue and population are both growing, we have the ability, rather the obligation, to fuel that growth and utilize reserves for one-time projects, even while we maintain a healthy surplus, protecting our state's AAA credit rating. Indeed, the work we've done together has brought us to this position of strength that calls us to invest in what I believe are needs and address head on both our competitive advantages and disadvantages. Fortunately, because of our growth, we have the financial wherewithal to do so, unlike some other states that balance their books with high taxes and debt. <laughs> but back home again in Indiana, last year was the kind of year that would justify some grand language. For starters, again, our revenues increased, our taxes and debt decreased. We're now among the top five lowest debt states per capita in the nation. You'll recall, we even returned $1.5 billion to Hoosier taxpayers in the form of a refund. And Forbes just ranked Indiana as the best state to start a business in 2023. <laughs> Forbes said it best. He said, and I quote, a business friendly climate with a low flat tax rate and above average business survival rate and a healthy amount of funding opportunities. Please join me in thanking the legislature for the partnership that helped make all this possible. Yes, my friends, whether you're an employee or an employer, Indiana's reputation for the career opportunities available and the kind of balance sheet that we oversee means all eyes are on our state and for good reasons like for the sheer amount that career creators are choosing to invest in our state. I know I'm a broken record on these broken records, but it bears repeating. The over $22 billion in committed capital invested in 2022 is an all-time record many times over, and much of it will take place in rural and mixed rural areas throughout our state, with hourly wages nearly 40% higher than the state's average. In case anyone is wondering why I travel overseas occasionally, an unprecedented $7.2 billion of that 22 billion came from places all over the world, 
rest assured that I bring suits and ties, not shorts and sunscreen. All these investments, <laughs> all these investments have a huge impact on Hoosiers throughout our state. In counties like Boone and Floyd, where committed jobs average over $50 an hour. And in Davies County, over $70 an hour. These high wage job opportunities are the best way to keep our kids close to home. And there's more coming. So let's keep surfing Indiana's wave of momentum and reach 23 billion in 2023 this year. Now, to do this and capitalize on the industries of the future that are looking for their new homes somewhere in America, like semiconductors and electric vehicles, means we must formalize the economic development tools that you all gave us last session and establish them in our budget. And if we have more opportunities, good problem to have, that exceed those resources, it's only prudent to provide state budget leaders the ability to be nimble and consider and allocate the needed resources so we can fly out of the fourth turn and edge out the competition down the negotiation stretch. It's been said that investment is the strongest sign of a promising future. Well, ladies and gentlemen, investment loves our state. And we have a race plan in place to help all 92 counties reach their next level aspirations. That includes finishing I-69 next year. <laughs> Connecting Evansville to Indianapolis and beyond, three years ahead of schedule, by the way. Double tracking the South Shore rail line up in Northwest Indiana. and connecting homes and schools and businesses via broadband internet, even on our most remote terrain. After all, there are autonomous tractors in the field, just as there are robotic assembly lines in our factories that all need to communicate up and down the supply chain. And speaking of connecting, tonight I'm pleased to announce through our Next Level Trails program that we're adding a major acquisition to our state's trails legacy. Wait for it. <laughs> Director Dan Bortner and his Department of Natural Resources team led negotiations on behalf of Radius Indiana and the city of New Albany with big time help from Steve Ferguson at the Cook Medical Group to acquire an old abandoned rail corridor running through Clark, Floyd, Washington, Orange, and Lawrence counties. Once completed, this recreational trail that follows the route of the historic Monon Railroad will be 62.3 miles, the longest contiguous multi-use trail in the state. Trails and land conservation are sweet spots for Janet and our dog Henry and myself and a lot more other Hoosiers. No wonder we were recognized last year as the national rail to trail champion and that our state park inns have the highest occupancy rate in the country. With this, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, With this new Monon South Trail, we will have invested nearly $150 million in trails since 2019. Another great example of the state helping meet the demand to explore and discover in Indiana, right in our backyards. So I'm seeking $50 million more for trails to continue our momentum, along with another 25 million to build on our highly successful land conservation program with partners like the Nature Conservancy, 
and the Central Indiana Land Trust so that even more Hoosiers and our guests can enjoy Indiana's great outdoors. With this type of momentum and so much more, I'm forced to utter that familiar phrase. Ladies and gentlemen, the state of our state is strong and about to get stronger. But I don't want that phrase to distract us from my bigger purpose tonight. It's the getting stronger part of the equation that I ask for your help over the next two years. Because even though we've accomplished a great deal in Indiana, it's obvious we have much more potential yet to be realized. And these challenges can't be ignored or wished or hoped away. When individuals, communities, and businesses step up, acknowledge their challenges, and take steps to reach their next levels, they should know their state has their back. And it will take new action to get new results where public health is concerned. So let me first thank the Public Health Commission, which completed its work last summer, and especially the co-chairs, former State Senator Luke Kenley, former State Health Commissioner Dr. Judy Monroe, and our current Health Commissioner Dr. Chris Box and her team. Thank you. Now, I hate to remind us, but I will. We rank 45th for smoking, 46th for obesity, 43rd for access to mental health providers, and 41st for childhood immunizations among all states, our competition. But re what really struck me is that our life expectancy in Indiana has declined in recent years, specifically among those who are front and center to our future, working aged adults between 25 and 64 years old. That's a pattern we have to reverse. And I will politely push and prod and poke everyone I can to adopt the commission's recommendations, including a significant increase in our state's public health appropriation $120 million in the first year and $227 million in the second year. Nearly all of these dollars will be deployed locally in your districts where our fellow Hoosiers need them, tailored to the unique circumstances of each community partner. In fact, this initiative will come from the Willing Counties to design and propose ways to leverage their own funds in an 80-20 state and local mix. Our health and well-being challenges, of course, extend to addressing mental health problems, helping Hoosiers defeat addiction, maternal and infant mortality, and assisting our veterans who face double the risk of dying by suicide than other groups. So our localized pathways to improvement must include programs to attack these issues close to home by building sustainable systems that prevent and respond to a crisis, like our 988 system is doing today, and investing in data-driven, evidence-based community programs with the opioid settlement funds we're receiving now. We don't have a day or a dollar, certainly not a life to waste. So taking the next four months to get this right, nothing could be more important. Just as we craft our new state public health system 
We already have a great example of a tailor-made community development program. Our first $500 million ready investment leveraged another six and a half billion dollars, over two billion toward housing alone, and has become an indispensable part of our business and talent attraction efforts while offering a boon to every county and city and community that steps up. There's already a queue of requests seeking another $400 million to leverage nearly $7 billion more of private and other non-state funding. So I'm asking you, the legislature, for another $500 million to launch Ready 2.0 to lock in more transformational projects. And while READY is our secret weapon to attract more talent to our rural and suburban and urban communities, it's irrefutable that we must do more to prepare and retain our homegrown talent too. The most important determinant of a child's success in adulthood is their education. Furthermore, the quality of their education relies overwhelmingly on two groups of people, parents and teachers. Since 2017, I'm so proud of the work we've accomplished together to support unprecedented investments in K through 12, which has translated into school districts answering the call to raise teacher pay. Starting teacher salaries now reach $40,000 and we're closing in on the goal of achieving an average teacher salary of at least $60,000 a year. But to ultimately reach the goal, we need to continue what we started by making the state's largest ever investment in K through 12 tuition support and increase a $1.1 billion and give schools the resources to continue equipping our children's educators. Hoosier parents are no more sheltered from the rising cost of living than their child's teachers. And for these parents of school-aged children, fees for curriculum materials essential for in-class instruction can be in the hundreds of dollars each year per child, depending on the district. Sadly, Indiana remains one of only seven states that still allows this disguised tax to be levied on parents each year. One such parent joins us tonight, Mandy Allen, a school counselor in South Vermilion School Corporation. Mandy paid about $630 this year for books for her four children. Our state's constitution promises a tuition-free education. Let's cover the full cost of curriculum fees paid for by parents so that folks like Mandy don't have to pay this dreadful bill ever again starting the next school year. And while parents and teachers are the essential human ingredients in a child's education and curriculum materials are essential for instruction, no child can succeed without the ability to read. There is overwhelming evidence that a child who cannot read by the third grade is more likely to become the adult parent who can't read and therefore disadvantaged for life and the cycle continues. With nearly one out of every five kids in Indiana currently at risk of falling behind in reading, 
We must do everything we can and we must do it now. Last summer was a good start with the help of the Lilly Endowment. We made the state's largest investment in literacy to help prepare more current and future teachers for reading instruction. And the budget I submitted last week proposes to reward schools that improve their results in third grade reading as well. But even before entering the classroom, children should have access to books at home and develop a love of reading. That's why I've proposed funding Dolly Parton's Imagination Library so children from birth to age five statewide can receive high quality books each month at home with their name on them. <laughs> then at the other end of the public education spectrum, I'm asking the legislature to support a $184 million increase in higher education funding and support the Commission for Higher Education's proposal to reward our world-class universities in our state to help keep their graduates here in careers in Indiana. After all, Indiana's college campuses need to be the epicenters of brain gain, not brain drain. Another pathway to brain gain is enrolling more first generation and low income minority college goers, which is why we should support Martin University's mission. And we can easily, easily ensure thousands more students have their college opportunity paid for by automatically enrolling all financially eligible students in the immensely successful 21st Century Scholarship Program and do it once and for all. This year. Finally, but no less importantly, we must invest in adult learning and workforce training in a variety of tailored ways, including increased support for our next level jobs programs, expanded access to the Excel centers, and a pilot program to incentivize recipients of unemployment insurance to obtain their high school diplomas and then on to a job. And we need to expect that even more of these great ideas, these difference-making programs will be initiated and developed by our own workforce cabinet because Indiana should light up a pathway to anyone looking for upward mobility. We We don't just want everyone in the workforce, we need everyone in the workforce, and by golly, we'll help you get there. At the outset of this address, I mentioned that many of the investments were ones that we needed to make in this budget, and that's only made possible by our careful stewardship to grow the private, not public sector. Yet I'm mindful, as public servants, we must maintain the strength of our good government services that Hoosiers rely on each and every day to grow themselves. And there is no more essential service than public safety. That's why my... <laughs> That's why our budget calls for major investments in school safety, law enforcement, and our firefighters across the state. <laughs> Specifically, I am asking you, the General Assembly, pleading with you to join me 
increasing school safety grants by 30%, fully funding our court's request to upgrade technology and make greater use of our problem-solving courts, making investments to finally realize a true statewide firefighter training system and to buy the necessary protective equipment for our volunteer forces. And let's And let's raise the starting pay for Indiana State Police to $70,000 a year. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I hope you'll take away just a few things from tonight. Number one, like you, I hope I'm proud of our stewardship of state government. Here in Indiana, we have a well-run, soundly financed state, and the word is out. And two more broadly, this is Indiana's time, and we're on the move. Our economy is growing. New and exciting opportunities are in reach. Investors are giving us their vote of confidence. They're creating industries and careers here they see their growth and their future here. Let's prove them right. For we know there is demand for what Indiana offers, so let's redouble our focus on the supply by building pathways on which more Hoosiers can travel on to become healthier and wealthier and wiser. I stand before you as a full and faithful partner in getting this done, and I intend to step on it coming out of turn four. Thank you, and may God continue to bless our efforts. Thank you. The joint convention is now adjourned. Representative, Representative Lehman, we have a motion to adjourn a second. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed no. The motion is adopted. We are adjourned. <laughs>